everyone. Welcome to Textiles and Tea. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Marketing Manager, and I'm going to be your host today. Today, we are sponsored by our friends at Lunatic Fringe Yarn. I love their saying, unique yarns for unique people, and they are unique. If you've ever dealt with them, they're great. You'll love them. Uh, we will take questions as usual today. They'll be the last uh, 15 minutes of the hour. We'll get to as many questions as we can. And please put your questions in the Q&A because I can't see them when they're in the chat. Love your comments in the chat, but if you have a question, put it in Q&A and we'll get to it as soon as we can. I wanna thank our, um, um, we're gonna, after we do our questions, we'll uh, move on. Uh, today we are uh, hosting Susan Martin Maffei. Um, Susan is an internationally known tapestry artist whose background includes art studies at the Art Student League in New York City. She has tapestry training in Paris. She did an apprenticeship and studio work at the Shower uh, Tapestry Studio in New York City. And she um, is a conservation, conservation of ancient textiles at Art Weave Gallery in New York City. She's been weaving her work professionally since 1985. She has taught, lectured, exhibited all through the US and abroad, and has had many works in both public and private collections. Hi, Susan, welcome. It's wonderful Hi. to have you here. Uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me. It's our pleasure. So most important question when we start, what is your favorite tea? Yes, my favorite tea is turmeric and ginger. Oh, what a perfect combination. Yeah, very spicy, but uh, kind of a lift. It's very good. Yeah, and it's good for you, right? And it's very good for you, yes. Yeah. Especially, especially as we age. <laughs> <laughs> You're ageless, Susan. You're ageless. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> Can you share with us how you got started in fibers? Uh, that's probably a long story and probably quite a few items. Uh, I think probably it goes way back to childhood where uh -huh. I spent uh, quite a bit of time with my grandmother because we had a lot of illness in my family. And so whenever they were off, I was with my grandmother and she was a great needlework person, knitted, crocheted, uh, cross stitch all kinds of things. And uh, she taught me, I mean, she had one of those old fashioned treadle singer machines that I actually still have of hers. That's what I wow. have. But when I was a kid, she got me a little tiny one that had like a little handle that you want for me to make all my doll clothes and everything on. So I think that was my first introduction to fiber. And I think that pretty much stayed with me all, uh, all of my life. But coming to tapestry specifically and weaving had more to do with one of my previous lives, which was as an antique dealer. And I dealt in early American painted furniture and I became very enthralled with all of the items out of the shakers and curious about how they operated. So I started spinning and dyeing and weaving. So that, those two things I think were very important in my development. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know about the shakers. That's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the University of Kentucky and there was a, that was a big um, topic in our weaving studio too about the shaker work. and. The communities. Yes. yes, and up here in the Northeast, you know, we have a couple still Shaker villages around. So yeah, yeah. Very much in the antique uh, business, especially painted furniture, Shakers were kind of the top of the line. Well, you did an internship, and internships, I think, can just change your life many times, right? And one of the biggest changes I would think was that you grew up in rural New York and then you went to this internship in New York City. So I would imagine that change right there was huge for you. But how else do you think it impacted on you as a person and you as an artist? Uh, well, uh, two things. One, I, I grew up in, in a very rural area in New Jersey, not New York. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Even further out. 
<laughs> and uh, I've actually done two internships in my life. One was with uh, the Schroyer Tapestry Studio, and the other was with uh, uh, Le Goblin in Paris. And both of them, excuse me, I think were uh, such a change of culture being from a farming community in New Jersey and never being west of Philadelphia probably was the furthest west that I've ever traveled in the United States. So uh, going to New York City was culture shock. At first I was afraid to go into the subway, to go into that hole in the ground, to go somewhere. <laughs> Uh, and of course, too, in, in Paris, it's, it's a completely different culture. And I think before I went to Paris, I thought that all cultures were the same. Mm. I think we live very much in a kind of an isolated bubble here in the United States. And that was another huge eye opener for me. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I bet. So they changed the way I think about the world, pretty much. Well, how do you think that impacts your art? Oh, I think it has an awful lot to do with it. I think my art has always been my environment. And I think early on, when I first came to the United, uh, came to New York City, I was so overwhelmed with the fact that there were millions of people that were on the streets every day where you know, living in a farm community, it would be rare to see even your neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my early work very much was about uh, people and about uh, things that happened uh, mm -hmm. in New York, like the blessing of the animals at St. John the Divine, or just being in a movie house with, you know, a couple hundred people or people on the corner when you're crossing and waiting for a light, all of those things. And I think the same thing, um, I lived in Hawaii for a while after that, and uh, very much there living again in a more rural uh, area. I did a lot of cows and uh, different animals and bright colored flowers and and now that I'm back up in, I mean, I'm in North Country now in New York. So I'm very much back in a little, I live in a little hamlet on the Hudson. And I have a garden and I have goats. And so I'm kind of back into a bit of a, a rural kind of setting. And my, my work has certainly changed with the environment. But I think we're going to talk a little bit about that later. We are getting some... Um, comments that people are having a hard time hearing you, Susan. Right. Can you um, move your mic closer or turn your volume up a little bit? Uh, let me see where I can get my volume. Excuse me while I put this on. I think my volume, my volume is all the way up, but I will sit closer to my microphone and see if that helps. Is that any louder, people? It's a little bit. If you can just kind of talk up and. Okay. All right, well, I'll try, I'll try. Thank you. I'm a little, yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, you, um, I understand at one point you decided not to use cartoons anymore and just weave from memory, which I find amazing. Um, and this work called um, The Road to Halakala is one of those works. Can you talk some about that decision about not using a cartoon anymore? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, and this uh, road to Haleakala, which happens even close. Sorry, no, that's all right. Which happens to be about the volcano uh, on Maui when I lived in Hawaii, and I think that at that point uh, I had already been um, had done the two internships, both at the Shoyer Studio and at the the Goblin in Paris. And I was finding that what was happening to the work, because I was certainly trained traditionally using cartoon, was that I was simply filling in the lines. It was a bit like a coloring book where I would uh, draw something or paint something and then I would uh, mark the lines onto the weaving and 
and and weave. And it became, uh, I think those of you that weave know how slow it can be and uh, it can get pretty boring. And I decided uh, to start on little pieces and just start doing things from memory. It might be um, someone I saw on the basketball field or uh, someone I was uh, meeting or an animal in a tree. And I started small and the road to Haleakala was the first large piece that I did from memory. And it was about the road I lived on, in ha on the road up to the volcano is where uh, I lived. And so, and something I traveled all the time. So it was very, very easy in a way to sit down and just do it from memory. And that's how it started. And to this day, 99% of my work is done that way. Did it take some, I remember when I was in art school, my teacher said, you have to train your brain. Um, did you find that you had to train yourself to start thinking differently or? Yes, because you're not following the lines and you are having to work in a way, it's like always problem solving because you put something in and then you've got to build on it. And it's one of the things about tapestry that's so different from most other um, types of craft or art because you have to build it from one side to another and you have to build it in the way the structure is formed. So in a way, it's more related to sculpture where you're working from the outside to the inside. And I don't know, I've always been very good at um, uh, mental um, images, I guess I could say. I can remember when I was in high school and my guidance counselor, and I took the, you know, the typical class, the tests that you take when you get to a certain age, and they evaluate those tests to see what you're best at. And what I was best at was in the top like 10% of the United States of the visual, the ability to do visible kind of manipulation in the brain. And I can still remember the teacher who was my guidance counselor saying, oh my goodness, Susan, if you were only a man, what I could do with you, but however, you're not. So you can't go into architecture or, in, or uh, engineering or anything like that. You'll have to take a different path. I, it's it's amazing. It's just <laughs> listening to all this. It's like I never thought of it that way before. It's yeah, amazing. Was back in the sixties, yeah. So I was discouraged from doing any kind of art in school. I had none at all in you know uh, primary or secondary school. Wow. Yeah. Um, you have an interest, or maybe I should say, you have a passion. Uh, about books. As a matter of fact, you're a, um, a member of the um, Center for Books in New York. Yes. Um, and we have some images of the, it's an art, art book called The Narratives. Would you share with us how this project, it, first explain what it is if people can't tell from the images, and then talk to us how you came up with this brilliant idea. I love this. Yeah, it, it, it is a, uh, it's a handmade book made by me. Uh, and it contains um, it, uh, images of all the tapestries that I have been woven uh, in a particular elongated or scroll format. And so um, the, the book, uh, which is about the size of a, of a normal kind of uh, small book, I guess, I, it's a probably about five by seven or five by eight. But when you open it up, each one of the images, you then have to open up again in order to open up uh, as a scroll. And it was very much uh, influenced by uh, really um, scrolls, history sc scrolls, ancient scrolls. You know, when you think about uh, works on um, fiber, that are narrative and you go back in history, certainly scrolls were one of the very first 
that included that. They were often done on silk. They might have been painted, but they were also woven. And it was taking that influence and, uh, and making, making books. I have to say that um, my mother was really quite a book person. So I grew up with a lot of books around me. I've always had a lot of books. And books were something that my mother and I, because we shared that interest, very often we would take classes about making paper, you know, with the decals or printmaking or things like that. And so my interest comes from, again, from a much earlier age, but uh, I just felt it was something quite wonderful and something to, um, a way to get some of my images out into another area uh, of culture. Uh, there, there is so much to talk about in this, this next series that I wanted to bring up, and it's called um, Pandora's Box series. And the first one we're going to talk about here is called the European Hornet Invasion. And again, would you first kind of describe what this is and then talk about the, the idea behind it? Uh, yes, it, I'm, I've been working probably over the last... Hmm, I don't know, before the pandemic, maybe a year or two before the pandemic. So altogether now it's probably getting to be more like four years because we're getting into the third year of the pandemic. But, uh, and it is um, uh, something that I've been uh, exploring, if you want, uh, which uh, has to do with a few things. One is combining my interest in book arts having just talked about the book uh, with tapestry. Uh, and so I'm making the boxes and they're made out of book board, right? And the tapestries, I have been uh, basically using the idea of a tunic uh, representing the footprint of mankind and Again, the environment around me, because I'm working so much with my garden and my goats, is more about species that are having some difficulties, if you want, um, because of us, uh, either invasive or threatened or declining or so the whole series uh, is about that, and I have about 12 now, and they're much, uh, they're fairly fla fairly large. Well, a couple of them are small, more like 12 by 12, but the last groups that I've been doing are more like four feet by four feet, so they've become quite huge. This, this particular one is the European hornet, which is an invasive species here in the United States, but ironically enough, in Europe, and uh, in particular in Germany, it's become threatened, it's become endangered, and it's against the law to destroy them. So uh, it's a quite uh, uh, ironic. Uh, and in that effort to make this box, if you want, uh, maybe a wonder box, let's say, uh, Pandora's box. I've also been weaving the insects and the insects are, as well as the tunics, are three-dimensional. Uh, and I am uh, adding some additional uh, bits of crochet for the wings. And uh, in this particular case, I actually have done the hornet's nest, which it doesn't perhaps show up in the picture, but when you look closely, there is a mirror on the bottom of the box that allows you to look up into the tunic. And in the tunic is the nest uh, of the wasps where they deposit their eggs. And I've done that with, um, I've done that, I don't know how many of you go to camp anymore. When we were kids, my generation, we all went to camp and you had to make these, these kind of lariat things that you had around your neck. And we used to do it with a spool, a wooden spool with four nails in it. And you could make this kind of 
while the nest is all made with that, made out of linen paper. Actually, most of the weaving on the tunic is also made with paper. It's made with linen paper. It's one of the wonders of, uh, of, the, cent of the part of the century we're now living in that there's so many more materials now to be used for tapestry. It used to be, you know, wool or cotton for the warp and then, you know, wool only for the weft. But I find now I'm... I'm just fascinated by the uh, kinds of things that are being offered that you can use for uh, to work in fiber. I have to wrap my brain around the <laughs> how much work you have inside the piece. That's just amazing. And I guess I'm a little shallow, but it's like, doesn't it bother you that you, nobody can see it except from that mirror? That's so much work. Um, I, 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 I actually, I, I think I have a bit of, um, I don't know if I'd call it an obsession, but I have a tendency to cover a lot of things. Uh, ah. I, I, don't, I don't know, it, it's, um, it's an odd, one of it, one of those extreme extreme kind of things that all of us have that little oddities and i love the idea of surprise and so even the whole conception of this pandora's box is that you don't know what's inside until you open it and with this particular one you open it and it's like oh, what is that and then you get closer and you look down and you say oh What's that? Because you're seeing the mirror and you're seeing up inside and then everything is kind of falling together. So anyway, that's the way that I see it. And it, and it is planned that way. And I must say, I mean, for those of us that work in tapestry, tapestry is one of the slowest things you can do. <laughs> so, so time is not, not really an issue when you do tapestry, I don't think. Oh, wow. Now we're going to show another piece from this series. People are saying they want to see it again, but here's another one. And this one shows the, the box as that's closed up right. as well as open. So can you tell us a little bit about, now you said that some of these are four feet Are these last two, the big ones, the four feet ones? Uh, no, the, okay. this one is probably, well, when it's opened, it, you know, spread out like it is in the left-hand picture, it's probably at least five feet, maybe a little bit more. Wow. So yes, it's quite big, but the height of it is not. The height of it is probably more like 20 inches, I think. And the last one is probably, the height of it is probably more like 30 inches, I think, or 32. So uh, we're not quite at the big ones yet. We're kind of in the middle. We're not with the little ones either. We're kind of in the, in the middle. This piece is about blue jays, which I think most of us uh, are familiar with. It's a very beautiful blue bird that most of us know. If you're uh, even in the city, we have blue, we have blue birds, I mean, um, blue jays. And uh, it, it has to do with the fact that um, they've been on decline now for maybe over 15 years. And the reason being is, is because they are affected by the West Nile virus. And if any of you know, the West Nile virus maybe 10 or 15 years ago was affecting people and people were dying from it. And uh, it's interesting that only the um, uh, uh, cor uh, corvid um, species of birds, they're also mm -hmm. affected. So that's crows and ravens and those, but blue jay is part of that family. It is part of the COVID family. And for many, many years, I have been, when, uh, whenever I hike or walk or that, and I collect feathers and I have, hundreds if not thousands of feathers that I find all the time and some of the most common ones are blue jay and I'm sure part of it is because it's blue and they're easy to see where some of the brown ones uh, do uh, go in and so this tunic what I tried to do was to incorporate the real feathers 
together with feathers that are woven. So the bottom of the tunic is woven. The middle of the tunic is feathers, real blue jay feathers. And then the top of the tunic is woven again. So it's a combination of found and woven. And I've put it in this box that now opens to be more of a panorama. So you can open it even further than what is shown in this particular slide. And I have included um, within that, I've done uh, some drawings. So it's kind of a branches and I've made a nest out of chicken wire and I've made some eggs of the blue jay uh, just by wrapping. Uh, and I've included um, the skull uh, that I found of uh, probably not a blue jay, it's probably more a blackbird or a crow or something. Uh, and uh, cut out some letters that say on decline. And it is the Pandora box for um, blue jays that are on decline. I, I totally missed the letters. If you hadn't said that, I thought that was just design. No, <laughs> Thank you for saying that. That's all right. It's Nothing always, gets past me. I'm on top of things. That's amazing. But I do love the um, the um, branches, how it goes from the dark and the outside into the inside. I love that. Yeah, it just makes it seem as if the, uh, you know, the tunic representing the bird or for uh, or representing us, but the bird is in the tree as is the, it actually runs across the bottom too, where the nest is. So it kind of sits into I've enjoyed it in including, and I, and I seem to be doing more and more of that, of including found items in now my, uh, either the weavings themselves or, or the boxes, and also doing some painting, some drawing, uh, some printmaking, and other skills that I have including, and carving, wood carving. Some of the bigger boxes now are actually wood. They know they're no longer made of bookboard, but they're wood that I am carving. Um, yeah. Do you think um, growing up in a, a, a rural area has made you more sensitive to what's happening to, you know, our birds and our animals and our environment? I would think that today it would be pretty hard for most people not to know what's happening. I mm -hmm. mean, it's an age of uh, exchange of information. And probably if it were 50 years ago, I would say yes. But I think in today's world uh, with communications the way they are, I would be really surprised if people didn't know what was happening to the environment. But we're going to shift a little bit here to, you do a lot of things. So now we're going to talk about your portraits. Um, your portraits seem to reduce um, the, the image down to essential lines and colors, but yet they're also so complicated, beautifully so. Um, and in this figure, it's called Joan. It's part of the uh, Women in History series. So can you talk some about how you came upon this style, how you developed this style? Well, I think it has to do what we have talked about in terms of not making a drawing and simply following the lines but instead you're building something. It's more, like, it's more like telling a story in a way. It's more of a narrative. And even, if the, even in the series that I'm doing now, it really has a narrative um, key to it. And certainly the women in history is really the same thing. So this was to be uh, a modern Joan of Arc. So uh, using you know, first of all, the little uh, fleur-de-lis, which is representative of France, right, in the design. The armor that she has on is actually made from real gold thread. It's gold, it's metal. That whole part is metal. Uh, and then using some of the probably technical um, style, I guess you would say, how would you put it, uh, blending techniques and that, but uh, exaggerating 
them uh, helps in in what's happening up in the in the face and the head. So being very much uh, tapestry, and when you work like that, it, it's it's a way of having them only work in tapestry. So you, you have to see it. And when you see this, it wouldn't work as a painting, it wouldn't work as a drawing because of the fiber and the nature of it that is incorporated into it. It has to be tapestry. And working that way helps you to, I think, to achieve that. I, I, this is a beautiful piece. It's so balanced. You. Um, your your eye just travels so naturally over the whole thing. It's just amazing. Now, um, what? Why did you choose the topic of women in history? Uh, I think it has a lot to do with uh, growing, uh, growing up in the particular uh, era that I did. I guess I'm. I mean, I'm a you know, post-World War II baby and the boomers, part of the boomers. And I think very much uh, the boomers were much more aware of uh, perhaps the fact that there, were, there weren't a whole lot of um, women uh, in positions that we could look up to unless we went back in history. And so the women in history were kind of like that. I mean, the first one I did was Eve. I started right at the very beginning. And I think there's six altogether in this series. So you've got Anne Frank on the left and you've got uh, Lady Godiva on the right in these particular images. And I just took a particular format. Uh, they're probably about um, 40, I think they might've been 42 or 45 inches high. I don't remember now, but you no, know, just under four feet high and uh, probably about 15 or 18 inches wide. And just tried to working within that confined um, structure, make them all. So they're all kind of uh, identical in size and just worked through women that I thought were important to look back at women who did something important in terms of our history. Somebody isn't gonna be doing that for you. <laughs> I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna do a tapestry of you because you've laid the groundwork too. Yeah. Um, no, I have to say that uh, I lost my partner not too long ago and the last tapestry that he did was of me. So there is already one. Oh, good, good. <laughs> we're all sorry for your loss. Thank you. I, Thank we are, we're glad you're still working and producing and- I am, I am a maker and uh, uh, giving up making is not possible for me. Right, good, good. Well, you have had mentors in your life, um, people who've influenced you and helped you. Who are, were those mentors for you? I've been extremely lucky. I have had many, many, many mentors. <laughs> and just to mention a few, I mean, probably my early teachers, uh, I, you know, Jean-Pierre La Rochette and Yael Laurie, who are the father and mother of tapestry in the United States, were two of my early teachers who gave me not only a lot of technical, but also a lot of design um, uh, influence and also gave me a little peek into the life uh, a simple but beautiful life of being tapestry weavers. And so uh, they were very influential. Mary Lane, who, uh, who used to be the executive director of ATA, just recently retired. Mary was my very first tapestry teacher. She was teaching at Parsons University back in the, 80s, I guess, early 80s, it must have been. And Mary was responsible for getting me the internship at the Scheuer Tapestry Studio. So uh -huh. she, right, also 
uh, was uh, a mentor. And actually, Ruth Scheuer, who owned the studio, she was responsible for getting me the internship and scholarship uh, to the Goblin in Paris. Uh, so those groups, and they're still friends, and not to mention uh, my love and my life partner, Archie. He was my biggest fan <laughs> and certainly probably my biggest mentor as well. And I guess I would, I would like to say too that, you know, certainly those people are so important in, in, and just, I happen to be in the right place at the right time but, you know, all of the students that we taught through the 30 plus years that we taught together, they're also mentors because I think teaching really helps you to kind of codify what you're doing and being able to pass that on to, to other people and students who are interested is really also a mentoring process coming from them, not me to them, but them to me. So, and for so many years, we taught from the studio. We had a regular um, thing going on besides the workshops that we did all around the world. And I have to give my salute to the Wednesday group who was uh, very important over those 30 years. Can you share with people what the Wednesday group is? Sure. The Wednesday group, when we first moved from Hawaii, because we first lived in Hawaii together, Archie and I, and we moved to New York City, I think it was in 1993, we opened the studio and we uh, started offering classes. And uh, our very first, uh, very first, uh, teaching together was was there and not oddly enough but two of those students from that very first class were still with us when we stopped teaching uh, probably five uh, I'm trying to think how many years it's been now um, after Archie had a stroke we only taught for maybe a year or so after that so it's been quite a number of years since, maybe five years ago or more, six years ago. And they initially came every week to the studio. And then as they got more experience, they came every other week. <laughs> and then as they got even more experience, they came uh, uh, for uh, only once a month. And when we moved up here to North Country, which was probably uh, must be going on 12 years now, uh, they would come for the weekend and we would teach the weekend, but then we, we would have dinners together and share things. We did a lot of exhibits together. We did an awful lot together with uh, the Wednesday group. They were, they were, they were great. They still are a great group and they're still weaving out there, which is fantastic. It reminds me of when you take art history and they talk about, you know, the the elite eight group or the northern painting group. It's it's like you created your own um, art group to be known in the future as the Wednesday group. That's right. It was the Wednesday group. Yay, Wednesday group. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have um, traveled a lot from what I can tell, yes. and even hearing you talk, you talked about being in Hawaii and, and all these different places. So how has, I mean, I'm always interested to hear how um, traveling has influenced people and impacted on their art. Oh, well, I think it, as I mentioned with uh, uh, experience uh, in France in particular, you know, how it made me realize that we're not all the same when it comes to culture. It's, it, 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 and each place has their own particular way of operating, if you want. And certainly traveling, it just makes you more, uh, I think it makes you more open, frankly. I think mm -hmm. it makes you much more open to 
um, things that are different, uh, people that are different. Um, and I guess the one thing that's always interesting is that tapestry has its own language. So no matter where we were teaching, whether it's Australia or, uh, you know, or Northern Territory, Canada, with the Eskimos up at the, at the North Pole or whatever, tapestry has a language all its own. And that's the most universal thing. That's the exchange. Okay. Oh, that's unique. That's unique. Mm. Um, your, topics, your topics of work and then the, the technique that you use are so varied. Um, you do portraits, you do city, cityscapes, you do 3D multimedia. So how are you able to move from one to the other? You, you seem to just do it seamlessly. Uh, I don't know. I guess, it, as, as I said, maybe because we've moved around a lot or maybe because we did travel a lot that that part of exposure to things that are different, um, opens up your head to different, uh, different ideas? I mean, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I do have a tendency to work in series and the series are usually related to something that's personal. Uh, and it can be personal, uh, and it can also be political. So I, I don't know. I, I think maybe that is part of the ability to move around and travel. Um, you've also had several paths in your artistic life. I, I was amazed that part of your studies was um, conservation of textiles. Um, so can you talk some about how you went down that road? Well, the truth is that being a tapestry weaver, right, is not the easiest profession to pick economically. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it that way. That was nice, nicely done, nicely done. Okay. okay, and so often there are other things that you have to do in order to pay the rent. And, um, it, you know, you can, I mean, I was lucky too with when I was first came to New York City that I had a job with Shoyer Tapestry. And I can't tell you what that experience is like, how it helped me to actually, you know, to actually work every day and be able to weave and do what you love to do. I mean, it's, a, a, it's really a learning and an and a increase of skill kind of practice. Uh, but by the same token, I was lucky in that Ruth was very liberal with us. We guaranteed so many hours and that was it. So while I was working there, I was able to go to the Art Students League. That's when I attended Art School. Oh, wonderful. When I, when I, was, uh, when I was working there. But uh, after I came back from the Goblin, I decided not to go back to the Scheuer studio and instead opened my own studio uh, in the city with a, a fellow weaver, a very good uh, weaver. She was um, Austrian and we shared a studio together. Uh, we did classes and we did, uh, did weaving, but to pay the rent, we had to have a, another supplement. And that's when um, I started doing conservation with uh, a gallery, Art Weave Gallery, that dealt in antique textiles. And they trained me. Uh, and actually, uh, Art Weave then became Gail Martin Gallery. And Gail Martin Gallery was my gallery for many, many years. Gail is now retired but she also is one of my mentors. So we, we keep up together. Well, did, did um, doing the conservation give you kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking I would be going, oh, so I need to be careful about doing this, or this is what happens if you do textiles this way. I did, did you learn something about, that, about textiles or tapestries or whatever that impacted on you while you were making them too? Terrific. 
so influenced by historical tapestries. I mean, huh. it's kind of like traveling, but it's traveling back in history. You're dealing with antique textiles. Not all of them are tapestry, of course. It's all different kinds of fiber art. But to be able to handle it and oh. actually see it, it, it really changed so much, not only of my uh, approach in a, uh, in a art, art way, but uh, an approach in the actual structure of what I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, the tunics really grow out of that. And so much of the, the balance of what I do, uh, the balance of putting the weight at the bottom of what you're weaving, uh, being so aware of the structure having an influence on how the how it hangs or how it's looked at, how you travel in, where you go from point A to point B. I learned so much from historical textiles. I cannot tell you. I am a different weaver because of that. Definitely, definitely. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm assuming at the time when you're going, okay, got to pay the rent. I'll do this. I'm assuming at the time you weren't going, and I'm going to learn a lot while I do it. Or maybe you knew that. Maybe you knew I'm going to learn tons while I'm doing this. Uh, I don't know. I think the idea that it was textiles, because as I said, I've always had a bit of leaning toward textiles, even though, you know, Art Student League, I did, you know, painting and drawing. I've done some printmaking. I've done stone carving. I've done wood, Japanese wood, uh, wood cuts and I've done all kinds of things and I love exploring, but to me, my means of expression is tapestry. I am a tapestry weaver. That's what I am. So what's next for you? Ah, good question. <laughs> it's hard to know where any of us are going in this present uh, situation, but I don't know. I mean, I am working every day and I am, I'm not done with the series now that I've been working on. The Pandora Box series will continue for a while. I've got uh, plenty of ideas in my head and things that I, that I want to express. I've, I've become very unsure about the teaching because the world has changed so much and mm -hmm. I am really a computer Luddite. And I just absolutely refuse to spend the time on it. It just eats too much. And as a tapestry weaver, I would never get anything done. So the teaching, I'm still questioning if, uh, if that is. It may be that uh, I might like to do some more lecturing or something, something on a different, where maybe the computer would be uh, a relative thing. But certainly uh, exhibiting once this COVID thing is over, I'm hoping to be able to get some, uh, some venues and start showing the series uh, as a whole. So that's probably, that's probably my direction, at least for now. Enjoy my garden in the spring. I can't wait to spring. Not everybody may know that we're freezing up here in <laughs> northern New York. It was minus three degrees at nine o'clock when I, you know, I try to get out and take care of the goats before 10, but it's been so cold in the morning. I can't wait for spring in my garden. So uh, that those are certainly on the list. Well, we have tons of questions. So let's take a few oh, of them. All right. Um, Pamela Flateau, Flateau, I think it's how you pronounce it. What aspects of the, is it Goblin? Goblin. Mm -hmm. Goblin approach to weaving, have you integrated into your own style? Oh, well, I think that weaving, whether you do uh, Aubusson style, French Aubusson, or uh, which tends to be low warp, which means mm -hmm. that you're weaving on uh, a, horizon a horizontal loom. Uh, as opposed to the goblin where you weave on an upright loom. And I only weave on upright. I don't weave on, uh, on low warp. But, but in a way, all of the techniques are really similar. They're really similar. Uh, what I 
uh, have changed because of Archie is that I, when you weave Goblin, you weave from the back mm. and you have a little mirror in the front uh, in traditional, with the low warp too. You weave from the back and you have a little mirror to look at to see if you're doing it right from the front. And because of Archie, I only weave from the front now. I don't weave from the back because it's great to be able to see what you're doing. <laughs> um, Patricia Dunn wants to know, I'm curious about how you arrange your day with farm responsibilities and weaving artwork. I remember reading that you are a walker. I guess I'm asking about routine and ritual in your daily life. My ritual is I get up very early. I'm usually up between five and six. I have two cups of coffee in the morning before I do anything. <laughs> then, first, there's coffee. <laughs> first is coffee. First is coffee. Then I write a bit. And I've been writing, mm, I guess, kind of haikus, you know, small uh, or, or short poetry or something in the morning after my coffee, or even might be during my second cup of coffee. And then I do my yoga in the morning, because if you're going to be sitting and weaving all day, it's not good, especially for women my age. So I have a, <laughs> I have a yoga routine that I do. Then I prepare my breakfast and the goat's breakfast. I have my breakfast and then I go down to the goats and probably, I mean, I, the goats, because I have to clean the shed and the pen and the, you know, it's kind of, I probably spend a good, oh, I don't know, hour and a half or maybe more with the goats in the morning because they are pets. They are my pets. They do tricks. They have tricks that they do. They have a series of about six of all kinds of tricks <laughs> that they do for me. We work through the tricks. Uh, and then uh, I come in and uh, I go to the loom. And that's usually around, I try to get up there by 10 o'clock. And I work from pretty much 10 to four with a break for lunch. And then guess what? At four o'clock, it's time to feed the goats again. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I do a, a similar process, make my dinner. Uh, I feed the goats first and then I do my dinner. I finish and depending on what I'm working on, I don't like working at night when there's no light. In the summer, the days are much longer and I will uh, normally after I eat dinner, I will go back up and work. But in the winter, not so much. I might do the little crocheted wings on the bugs or something like that. And I have, uh, I, we used to have TV because Archie had a particular programs that he liked, but I've let the TV go. So I don't have a TV. But I do have a friend who lends me videos once in a while, so I might watch a documentary or something, or I read. As I said, I'm a book person, so I might be reading poetry. I'm reading D.H. Lawrence just now, all of his poetry. So, and then I'm usually in bed no later than nine o'clock. I bet when, you have to, that's a full day. That's pretty much my schedule. Yeah, there's not enough time in the in the day to get everything done that I yeah. want to do. I have a friend that we do drawing together on Friday. And I also have a couple of great neighbors who walk. And the weather has been not good for walking, but normally quite a number of times during the week, we will go and walk for anything from, you know, 20 minutes to a uh, couple of hours. It depends. Wow. Well, people were asking about the goats. They want to know, do you spin the goat hair? I have. Uh, I have spun goat hair, but not their hair. No, they okay. keep their hair. They need it in this weather. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Marie Gibson, who was just on, yeah. says, hi, Susan. Hi, Marie. And, uh, he said, Pandora still kept hope in the box. I think hope is a wonderful idea to hold on to and to bring to the future. Can you see hope as a tapestry? Ah, 
Uh, I suppose I can. I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, because of the situation, and maybe too because, uh, you know, I've been dealing with a bit of grief over the last couple of years that I tend to include things more like, you know, the skeleton and the head of something that's probably more mm, expressing my mood perhaps, but I actually see the, the things that I'm doing as animals who, or plants that are really quite beautiful, despite the fact that they might be invasive and, or destroying something. You know, some of the insects are about, you know, complete destruction, but they have a beautiful part to them. And so part of what I'm trying to do is to, to really present both the beautiful with the particular situation, which in most of them are caused by us, the footprint. It's the humans that are causing the problem, not the beauty of the insects. So I don't know, there's so many interesting insects out there. I've become really quite interested in all these unusual, and I think most people aren't aware of them. And I think that's another thing about this work is trying to bring people's attention to the beauty of these insects and plants. Well, we're running out of time, but there are several people asking about where they can see your work. Now, I know you have a lot of work on your website. Yes, I do. Okay, is there other places that if somebody wanted to travel to a gallery or who well, represents you? Yeah, I don't have a gallery um, just now. My, uh, my Gail uh, has retired quite a mm. number of years ago, so I don't, uh, I don't have a gallery. I do, if you keep an eye on the website, I mean, this, uh, this year I did have, um, uh, and I guess the year, usually I try to, even with COVID, I've been able to get a piece into, you know, one of the local museum shows or something, but uh, keeping your eye on the website maybe would be the best, best way to do it. The Fuller Museum um, uh, in Massachusetts has a couple of small works of mine. The um, the uh, Museum of Quilts in um, San Jose, I think California has uh, a work that I did while I was working for Scheuer, which was one of mine, both uh, design and weaving. Um, there is um, the Church of St. John, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine uh, in New York City has one of my big, um, my large works, The Blessing of the Animals, that they, they usually show it in the month of October when the, uh, you know, the Feast of St. San, San, uh, Francis is on. So there are some, you know, pieces around. There is, I don't know, if you, it, I think if you look on the website, probably there would be more information there. I don't, I probably should try to get my resume up on the website that can show you, you know, what collection they're, they're in. Hawaii uh, also has, uh, Council on the Arts has a piece that they sh of mine that they show quite regularly. So there is stuff around, but as you're asking, I know you need the places to be able to see. <laughs> Well, Mary Lane reminds everybody, hi, Mary, that um, to, to follow you on Instagram, and boy, that's true. There's some wonderful images there. And Rebecca Mezoff says, Susan, your influence in the world of tapestry is incredible. Thank you for your lifelong work in the field. You have inspired so many of us to follow this discipline. Do you have a feeling for the future of tapestry as an art form? Oh, I don't think tapestry is going to die. I really don't. I think tapestry will, will keep going. I think that it will, oh, you know, it's changed so much from what we think of uh, histor historically in a, uh, a Western kind of way. You know, when we think of historical tapestry, that was all mural, uh, that kind of thing. And certainly look at what's happening, you know, just in the last oh, I don't know, 50 years or something, it's come down to something quite small that 
you know, the average person could afford, you don't have to be making. So I think it'll just, you know, hopefully just keep changing with the times and we'll just keep, uh, we'll just keep producing. I mean, the tactile nature of it, our love of, uh, I think for most people, you know, the fact that we wear clothing that's made of fiber or, or what was I hearing? There was something today about some celebration in India where they have like, uh, what was it? A hundred thousand people or something that come to uh, the uh, particular river meeting at a particular time of year. And they set up this whole city and they sit it, they set it up with mostly fiber and take it down. It's there for 55 days because it's fiber and it's that they're able to take it down and it leaves no trace. And they go, I mean, we're not going to give up fiber. I, I, I just don't see mm -hmm. it happening. I just don't see it happening. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I've looked forward to this for a long time. Um, I, along with a lot of other people, obviously admire your work. Uh, many of the questions started off with how much people love your work and are thankful that you've been an advocate for tapestry. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get all the questions today, folks. A lot of your questions can be answered on um, Susan's website, and it is susanmartinmaffei.com. So go to her website, and uh, you can see a lot of... Uh, her work, um, things about her work, pictures of her goats, aren't they cute? Um, but thank you so much, Susan. We really do appreciate you being here today and sharing everything with us. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. I, I'm so happy that you asked me. It's nice in this, this role of confinement that we have to be able to, uh, to talk to people. So thank you very much. I also want to thank... Um, Lunatic Fringe Yarns for being our sponsor today. See all their beautiful yarns. And if you're looking for something basic, they've got it. But they also have a lot of unique yarns. And they have this new hemp. And also hemp that is elastic. It's got some um, elastic stuff in it. I just thought that was amazing when I saw that. So go check them out. They are at lunaticfringeyarns.com and see their full line of this beautiful new yarn they're carrying. Hemp is the, the hot ticket right now, so go check that out. Um, I do wanna remind you that we have some new things coming up. Um, if you enjoy um, programming like this, um, please support HGA by donating or joining. Um, a lot of our programs like we just had for the guilds, um, the Spain and Weaving Week, on and on, are supported by the donations to the Fiber Trust. So please go online and either join or donate at weavespindie.org. Um, also to remind you, we have some deadlines coming up. A call for entry for the mixed media, yardage, wearable art, basketries, and small expressions for convergence coming up this summer. Um, Exhibits galore this summer because we have the ones from 2020 and the ones from 2022. So if you're thinking about entering, check those dates. We're going to have some deadlines coming up. More information on that, of course, is at weedspindie.org. If you've missed an episode or you want to watch it with a friend or you want to see this one again, which I can understand, um, you can watch it on Facebook. You don't have to be a member. You can just go on and watch. And eventually they'll all be on YouTube. Uh, we're encouraging people to subscribe to YouTube. You'll get a notice when a new episode has been uploaded to YouTube. And we get money for HGA when we have subscribers. So thank you all for doing that too. Um, next week, we have David Van Busek, Buskirk, Buskirk, um, another incredible artist, and we're so excited to have them. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you, Susan. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. And again, Happy tea. Happy tea.